total claim submitted. So this is the amount which is going, we are going to sacrifice as a deduction or the, realize, for the amount of realization deducted from the total claim submitted is known as haircut. Generally, this is happening somewhere between 90 to 95%. But sir, let me tell you, uh, tell all of you, it is not the benchmark. Generally, it is happening 90 to 95%. In my own case, where I have realized 95%, only 5% is the haircut in one case. Whereas in my own case, in the second one, it is almost 90% is the haircut that we cannot justify or, you know, we cannot equate. This is the normal uh, situation where every company is undergoing to have this much of percentage as haircut. No, it's not like that. But it is totally based on what kind of assets are available. Now, just, you know, for an interaction purpose, let me ask you a question. Haircut is really, really a haircut in the true, true sense. Anyone can answer me. It is not haircut. Yes, sir. Exactly. It is not as such, you know, we are thinking that it is a haircut and uh, banks and financial institutions or the financial creditors for that matter, they are going to have a reduction in what they are ought to receive. No, it's not like that. The haircut, we have given the name, but as such, what is available with the CD? What is available with the resolution professional to present before the financial creditors to realize its value and make them the payment? That is most important. So already, once upon a time, when they have given the uh, loan or whatever it is, the financial facility, credit facility, at that time, the situation could be different. But maybe because of n number of reasons, the situation is different now. The assets, might, the assets of the company might have, you know, eroded. So now what is available with us, that only we can present. That is one uh, parameter. There is another parameter also. Are these financial institutions, if you see the corporate debtor on a standalone basis, the resolution plan given by the resolution applicant to the corporate debtor, is that the same thing, you know, what they are going for going? No, again, they're also, they are having n number of other channels where they are trying to recover their money. That is one is like uh, if PUFE transactions are there, if at all those transactions are reversed, the, the, face it, the benefit of that reversal of those transactions, whatever the amount being real, uh, realized, that is going again into the coffers of the financial creditors only. There is another parameter also. Like, are they just sticking only to the corporate debtor? No. They are going behind the corporate guarantors. They are going behind the personal guarantors to realize the balance. Of money. Then is the haircut, whatever been mentioned or whatever we are talking about all these years, in true sense, is it a real haircut for them? Considering these parameters, it is not the real haircut. Of course, I don't deny the entire outstanding or whatever the claim they have submitted, they are receiving that amount. They are realizing that amount. No, it is not like that. But still, the haircut in true parallels with respect to corporate data, whatever we are discussing or understanding, that is different. Because the, through other channels, the, through other parameters, they are realizing certain amount. What is the realizability? That is again a question of uh, argument, but I am not going into that. But yes, there are certain ways for them. Yeah, when we are uh, coming to this uh, to point, the word, this word has emanated during the Eurozone crisis and particularly in the context of the Greek financial crisis. The word haircut has uh, uh, started or taken shape or taken birth from this Eurozone crisis. And specifically the meaning of debt holders receiving less than par. So basically what we can understand is what the debt holders, are they receiving the entire debt or not, is the point of context here. So it's the market's unpleasant act for wiping out a large portion of the debt owed to the creditors. That is what 
the haircut means. Now let us see nexus between haircut and the IBC. What is that nexus? When companies which have fewer assets than its liabilities, they are witnessing the stress and entering the IBC clutches. As you all pretty well know, when the situation of the company is eroded, the financial strength or the solvency of the situation of the company is becoming questionable, then only it is entering the IBC clutches. That situation itself explains the assets are lesser than the liabilities. There is a very important aspect for us to consider here. The assets are lesser than liabilities, then only the companies are coming into IBC. Then when the assets are less, where from these people, they again is the liabilities who they are submitting the claims, etc. How they can get that liabilities fulfilled? Because the assets are lesser than the liabilities. That itself showcases that there is every chance, there is every situation where you have to go for a haircut. So the IBC mechanism works on avoiding value relation of the assets of the company. Yes, you, as you all know, the IBC mechanism works for value enhancement. Further, it, it puts a full stop for further reducing the value in the assets of the company. So that's where we are trying to try, make out whatever the payment possible out of the assets available in the CD. That is what we are going to make. So IBC aims to rescue the company if its business is viable under CIRP process or close its business in uh, if it is unviable under the liquidation process. Yes, this we all know. This haircut and all is coming both under CRP process as well as liquidation process. In CRP, it is the resolution applicant who is coming through the resolution plan and what is being offered against the assets available in the CD and against the CD, what he is taking up or taking over as the company itself. In that, whatever is being allocated to the creditors, that is the amount uh, deducted from the claims submitted by them. That is one scenario. Or if the COC says, yes, this uh, plan is not workable and let's go for liquidation or otherwise also, if the company is going for liquidation, then whatever the assets available, that will be sold out and the realized amount will be distributed among these people. Then also it will not be equal to the claims submitted by them. So in those both the scenarios that we can see this haircut. So if the assets are not adequate, then realization for financial creditors may fall short of their claims known as haircut. This is what is the haircut means in true sense. Again, this haircut, we have to see so many dimensions, so many perspectives, how these people are arriving at haircuts. Basically, these resolution applicants, they play a predominant role while investing in the stressful companies because they compete with each other for providing the best value. Here again, I would place before all of you, the situation is like two way. One is the company has gone for uh, IBC clutches and now it is in a uh, uh, stressed mode. Once the company is in a stressed mode, automatically the value will get reduced. That is one scenario. So that's where the haircut is. But on the positive side, if the, as whatever the assets available and there are multiple resolution applicants bidding for that uh, particular corporate data. Then in those resolution applicants, there will be a competition. And then we can definitely uh, you know, put, for, put them for discussion table, bring them for discussion table and ask to enhance. Then the person who is making a higher value or providing higher uh, uh, realization for the credit ads, that person will become the successful bidder and successful resolution applicant. So haircut will have the two-fold situation where the, uh, based on the company going on to IBC, yes, there is a haircut possible. And once it has come to CRP and the resolution applicants are coming with resolution plans, because of the competition between them, there can be an enhancement in the realization. Therefore, the haircut also may get reduced. Now, percentage of haircut under IBC. This varies from zero haircut to 100% haircut, depends on what kind of assets are available. Just now in the beginning, I have told you about two situations and two company CDs where I acted as a resolution professional. It is almost like, you know, 5% is the haircut in one company and 95% is the haircut in 
another company. So that depends. It is not just the credibility or the greatness of the resolution professional or something like that. It is only what kind of assets are available. So to make it more interesting, I will tell you the these two companies. One company is a holding company which is having investment in its subsidiaries where I have acted as resolution professional. And what are the assets? The asset of the holding company is nothing but the investment, the shares held by it in the subsidiary companies. And those subsidiary companies are the power generating units. Then uh, the subsidiaries are also in a financial trouble situation. Then what value can be assigned uh, or ascribed to the investment of holding company? So that's where the realization is very hard and we could not realize anything out of that. And uh, the liquidation value is also mentioned uh, by the values is almost like zero. And even in that also 5% we have received uh, uh, as a resolution plan amount and then by the rest of the 95 percent it is haircut in that company whereas coming to the second company it is a building stru structural material manufacturing unit hey, Mahadev, <laughs> Mahadev, just one. Yeah. you received five percent of only of the lv is it was offered by the resident applicant in that first five percent of the five percent of the claims submitted sir Achha, okay thank you yeah, for, in my case the liquidation value is much lesser than that the resolution plan amount is way higher than uh, the liquidation value because the liquidation value is almost zero. The investment is almost like zero of the holding company. Very recently, IBBA has uh, released one uh, statistics uh, comparing all the resolution professionals, IPs, where they have acted as resolution professionals in various companies. I think I am the second highest person in realization. The realization value of the liquidation value the percentage is way higher in my scenario. Just bringing to the notice of uh, all the participants. Yeah, in another case, it is having the assets which are related to the building manufacturing, uh, uh, building material manufacturing unit. So where the assets are very intact and they are, it is highly functional and it is a going concern. And the resolution applicant has come with 95% of the value as resolution uh, plan amount in his resolution plan. And the financial creditors are very happy with that. And the percentage of haircut mainly depends on the level of distress the company entered the IBC process. This is very important aspect, sir. At what point of time the company is entering the IBC? Is it like just now the financial trouble has started and immediately they entered the IBC, then your assets might not have down traded, down uh, uh, trodden. So the asset value is high. The possibility of realization will also be high. Suppose this situation is prevailing for a number of years and the situation is worsened over, over a period of time and then what could be the situation of the assets available? all the assets might be eroded. Then the percentage of higher cut will obviously be very high. So this is a, an important parameter to decide or discuss on higher cuts. So if the company is in distress for so many years and a majority of the assets were eroded, then the higher cut will also be on very higher percentage. There is one standing committee, uh, they have given in its finance report, implementation of IBC pitfalls and solutions in that report, what the secretary of MCA stated is, when asked about haircuts, the people have asked him that uh, these haircuts are ranging from 90 to 95%. Then he said, it depends on at what stage the company comes to IBC. If it is at a stage where it can be revived, the results would be better. If the company is entering IBC at a proper stage, then the recover recovery can be as good as up to 80 to 90%. Yes, this is very much happening. And resolution value is almost 188% of the liquidation value. I will give you the re uh, recent uh, latest statistics also, how the re resolution value, which, which is much more, way higher than even 100%, beyond 100% of the liquidation value. The IBC is not designed for haircut and is left to the wisdom of COC. Yes, this is very much important uh, statement. 
basically the ibc is not for designed for any haircuts whatever the assets are available based on that the realization value will be dependent on uh, dependent and the haircut is also percentage also decided but that is not the mechanism what for we are all working we, this haircut will be decided based on the wisdom of coc once we say it is wisdom of coc then obviously the coc will have in their hand the uh, valuation reports given by the registered valuers so they know the fair market value and the liquidation value and they will be in a position assessing what they can realize out of the assets available with cd then they will be also having the information memorandum available with them with the information memorandum whether there are any uh, corporate guarantors or personal guarantors uh, against the uh, loan given by them that information is also available with them and then not only that this uh, forensic audit or transaction audit might have been done by the resolution provisional and that report is also available with them so any possibility to recover such kind of transactions so that the uh, realization for the creditors can be enhanced this much of information is available with them that's why we say that it is the wisdom of coc to decide on the haircut when we are uh, thinking or you know looking the cd on a standalone basis if coc do not agree for haircut let us assume this is kind of situation if coc is not agreeing for the haircut whatever been offered by the resolution applicant then what happens then obviously the resolution plan will not be approved and then the company will go into liquidation so in liquidation again what happens what are the assets available with the company that only can be realized and after the realization of that assets that that will that only will be distributed to the uh, financial creditors so now it is for them either through resolution plan they want to have their realization that amount to be realized or they say no for it and go for liquidation sell up those assets and then get the distribution that is purely at the wisdom of the coc that is why we say wisdom of coc there is an annual publication report the, as i told you the, i will share you the statistics the statistics are like this as of december 2021 in 457 crps which were resolved rupees 8.34 lakh crore rupees was owed to creditors so this is what 8.34 lakh crores was owed to the creditors means that is what they have submitted as a claims and what the resolution plans have realized it is 2.59 lakh crores if you just see the first tab 8.34 lakh crores was the claim amount and 2.59 lakh crore is the realization amount if you just go with this parameter you will say there is a huge haircut there is a huge loss to the financial creditors the economy is going to a very bad shape so all these sentences and uh, uh, judgments will come in our mind but that is not true that is not correct let's go to the second uh, sentence however the correct comparison should be with the value of assets of the debtors the debtors is the company cd which was 1.51 lakh crore rupees so now just see compare the above sentence and the below sentence the realization is 2.59 lakh crores but assets available with the cdc is only 1.51 lakh crore rupees so whatever is there for you to offer it is 1.51 lakh crore rupees and then what you are realizing out of that is 2.59 lakh crore rupees is it not awesome and it is, is it not uh, you know fabulous job of i uh, all the insolvency professionals and uh, ibc mechanism yes it is truly yes so let us go with the percentage wise madhav ji just one question here please this 1.51 lakh crore is this the liquidation value we are taking that as value of assets yeah value of assets is the liquidation value Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Because fair market value we cannot assess, sir. Two point five nine lakh has come. It is just like a almost like a fair market value only, if you take it in another sense, because that is where the resolution applicants who are coming into the uh, take over the companies they are finding that value. So that is the fair market value we can assume, in a way. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, can I raise a point? 
please sir please sir uh, uh, in your in your first first part of that's this slide actually yes, uh, uh, the the economy is hit by 69% roughly right we got only 31% am i right sir uh -huh. Yes, sir. So, so, uh, as, so actually the value is lost by the economy. That means by the people, whether it yes, is sir. banks or FIs or NFBs or even individual employees. Yes. Is it? Yes, yes. So, so uh, that is there, sir. Because of that only, these companies are coming into the IBC and we are all trying to stop further, uh, you know, erod erosion of the assets of the companies. But probably that, we are that, not that looking into... We are not looking into the real ability from the promoters. Huh. That part we are still uh, we are not very much uh, uh, gone gone into this uh, IBC mechanism. Yeah, true, sir. What you are mentioning is absolutely true. That is why we are uh, in, we are looking into the IBC mechanism at all. But all said and done, there can be n number of reasons. What all those reasons we are not here to discuss because. Because of those reasons, only the companies have come into this situation. The troublesome, uh, the burden on the economy is there. That is inevitable. But given the situation, in the present scenario, what is that we are realizing? That is a great job, uh, what we are all, uh, all are doing, and even IBC is doing. If I and, say a little, uh, little, if I say a little, little critically, uh, yes, uh, don't mistake me, that no, is... No that, Use, using the IBC, the corporates are robbing the economy. <laughs> Here we have to see the, very carefully, In except for the provisions under uh, MSME, other than MSME, almost all such uh, scrupulous uh, promoters would be losing their companies. Yes. Where are they gaining? Yes. They tend to lose out, isn't it? And yes. there is one more point here that as far as this 8.34 lakhs is concerned, most of the times they are, uh, uh, it, they include the interest, penal interest, delayed interest and whatnot. So many charges are there. If yes. we go by 8.34, the principal value might only be 4 crores or might True. be even less than that. Even less than that, sir. Yeah. That is very so nice. Another so slide this is, is, a, nice. this is a artificial, uh, most of it is artificial. Enhancement. Yeah, artificial enhancement of the credit facilities provided by these financial institutions. That is also there, sir. No, so that is why I'm telling. Sir, sir, uh, sir, in this you regard, can't say I it is artificial. How can you say it is artificial? Sir, as an ex-banker, I want to contradict. Because yeah, some, some agreed terms are there. Based on that, only the institutions are charging the interest. If at all they can waive the additional interest, penal interest or something else. They should get a reasonable return from the, on the advances made. They have appraised the project, made the advance. They waited long. This kind of caricates will, uh, institution will think once, one or two times fewer lending. This kind of caricates. That's why sir, I'm telling, there are n number of reasons for the situation now. We are not going into those situations. There can be a flaw from the promoters the, because of their business relations have not worked properly. And there are, in certain cases, sir, there are genuine promoters also. And uh, they have taken all the measures, but still, maybe because of the business unviability and the you know situations prevailing at that particular point of time. For example, sir, the power, thermal power uh, sector, if you take, it has totally, you know, there is no fault from the promoter side, sir. It is a policy decision of the government which made those companies into troublesome. But at the same time, you know, there is certain flaw situations from the other side also, from the creditor side also. Sometimes, you know, they will not give the loan facility in the time when that is required, actually. You need to provide oxygen when the, when the patient is on ICU, when he requires that. So multiple, multiple scenarios are there. So let us not go into those things. But the haircut situation I am discussing here, so that is what, uh, you know, we are making a good uh, realization out of the liquidation. Mr. Mahadev, no, we, can't, we, we can't make a blanket statement regarding these power projects because many of them, there was over-invoicing of equipment, there has been siphoning of funds. Hmm. I mean, that is very much there and... Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, there are cases where the investigation is halfway. It has not been completed. Yeah. So actually, I, for example, why should not banks have the authority to mm -hmm. recommend that there should be an inquiry, investigation by ED? Because yes. you yes. know yes. clearly that the fellow is uh, uh, siphoning off. Yes, sir. In few cases, investigation was already yeah, ordered, sir. In few cases, I have seen where yeah. investigation was ordered. And sir, coming to the example of power sector, where since you have raised this point, let yeah. me tell you, sir, the generation cost is uh, way yeah. higher than the supply cost to the government, sir. Because sometimes, you know, government says to the company, you have to supply this much of power at certain rate. And that rate will not at all be feasible for those power companies. And I, because I have seen personally that power sector uh, units. Yes, I agree, so, sir. I agree. I agree. Yeah, that is there, sir. So, yeah. sir, I wanted to add one more small point only to this whole yes, macro angle. See, the amount of money which has come, that 2.89 lakh crores or something, that is yeah. deployable for other viable projects. No? See, the, there is an opportunity cost. That's yeah. a big thing. See, the yes. banks, otherwise, they are dependent on government to infuse the fresh funds and all this, you know, or they yes. have to go to market. So, this is also yes. coming. Otherwise, yes. see, but for this IBC five years, it could have taken yes. another 10 years also for this 2.89 to come. And yes. it could have been yes. half only by that time. So, that yes, angle sir. also we need to be yes. conscious. That is Thank there, you. sir. In my next slides, it is coming. That okay. is there. <laughs> yeah. So, therefore, realization by the financial letters under resolution was 165.8% as compared to liquidation value and uh, liquidation value and 33.1% as compared to the claims. So, if we see uh, claims versus what they realized, that is 33.1%. But if we see the liquidation value versus their uh, realization value, that is 165.8% in CRPs. Similarly, the liquidation scenarios also, it is the same. 292 CDs, which have been completely uh, completely liquidated, had outstanding claims of 49,500 crore rupees, but the assets were valued at rupees 2,293.42 crores. So out of this 2,293.42 crores, we could realize 2,177.6 crore rupees. That is again in a huge chunk. Yeah. And another thing, sir, why this section 29A was uh, incorporated in IBC? This was not there in the uh, when it was promulgated. The IBC uh, 2016, it was not there. This has come only after a year. Just now, we all were discussing the few promoters barring MSME. Those people are, you know, uh, they are not getting anything. But this MSME facility was given, but earlier to 2017, all the promoters can participate by submitting their resolution plans and they provide the haircut to all these financial creditors, huge haircut, and they are getting back these companies in the back door. So this was added later a year after the code was passed. Once it was realized that the debtor companies were using this mechanism to take over the company back after restructuring with a significant haircut to creditors. This is what these people are, all people are doing, all the promoters. So for avoiding such situation, this 29A has come. So for instance, the first resolution under the code, Synergy Store Automotive Limited, August 2007 was an eye-opener. Why it is an eye-opener? Because a related party of the defaulters company walked away with the company with a 94% haircut to the creditors. 94% total haircut and just, you know, he has given peanuts to the financial creditors and took the company again back in spite of all his misdeeds or anything. That's where this 29A has come into the picture. The Supreme Court in Chitra Sharma versus Union of India held that the purpose behind the bar against certain individuals is to ensure that persons responsible for the insolvency of the CD do not participate in the CIRP by means of a backdoor entry. Yes, because of these people only, you know, this company has gone for CIRP and the situation is now in a, a stressful situation. And again, those people taking back the company through backdoor, that is not a good thing. So to rectify, eradicate such situations, this 29A has come. 
Similarly, in Phoenix ARC versus paid financial services, it was observed that the IBC provides that any related party of a CD does not have the right to be part of the COC. So even in uh, COC also, the related parties are not supposed to sit. The object of such a provision is to prevent the decision of the COC from being sabotaged by related parties of the CD. Let us assume, sir, this financial creditor has a related party. If this stringent situation of not making the related party sitting in COC is not there, let us assume, what happens? That person will sit in the COC and he will entirely follow the uh, uh, CRP process. He will know, come to know about in and outs of what is happening in this company and what is happening in that CRP process. And is it not like, you know, giving advantage by, by, by having this information? So that, that is also to be avoided. By, uh, uh, sir. Uh, Mahadev, sir. See, Section 29A also prohibits the, a related party of the promoter and it also, you see, if the person has a record of having been an NPA, even if else, he cannot bid. Yes. So, and uh, there was one loophole because when the 29A was brought in, it was mm -hmm. only applied if it was an NPA under the Banking Regulation Act. Uh -huh. And then this was amended in uh, June 2018. Mm -hmm. That is under any enactment. So that otherwise what happens was that supposing something goes to a ARC. True. It is an NP under a different act. ARCs are not governed by RBI Banking Relation Act. Yes. So yes. then yes. that was a loophole. So that was plugged. Right. Yes, sir. True. So now when we are discussing about uh, haircuts, let us see what are the various scenarios under which, you know, these haircut has to be discussed or yeah, some thought process has to be uh, flown into that. One is resolution in a time-bound manner. Whether the resolution is happening in a time-bound manner, it will also have an impact on the haircut. The commercial wisdom of the COC, the la last two is having, is have, having a bearing on this commercial wisdom, that PUFE transaction, personal and corporate guarantors. Apart from this, withdrawal under section 12A, that is also having a bearing on the haircuts. And then balancing interests of the stakeholders. All these six parameters we will discuss through case laws, how these uh, situations have to be understood in the balance of haircut. Resolution in time-bound manner. This is where uh, the best case is Nagati Alang there versus Panna Pragati Infrastructure Private Limited and others. This was decided by the Supreme Court finally. So what happened in this we will see. Resolution in time-bound manner. Yeah. So section 12 says CRP should be completed within a period of 180 days from the date of admission. When we are talking about time-bound manner, yes, this is the time. What is being prescribed for uh, completion of the CARP under IBC 180 days and the RP shall file an application to the adjudicating authority to extend the period if instructed to do so by a resolution passed at a meeting of the committee of the creditors by a vote of 66% of the voting shares. So if at all that 180 days is not sufficient, then another 90 days can be done. Uh, the further we have to make an application, etc. So on receipt of an application, if the adjudicating authority is satisfied that CRP cannot be completed within 180 days, it may extend by such further period, not exceeding 90 days. Provided that any extension uh, of the CRP shall not be uh, granted more than once. Yes, we all know that it is only one time uh, occasion, 90 days only will be given. Provided that the CRP shall mandatorily be completed with a period of 330 days, including any extension time taken in the legal proceedings. So this is the legal stand given under the IBC. Regulation 39.1b and clause A. Approval of resolution plan. The committee shall not consider any resolution plan received out of the time as specified by the committee under regulation 36b. So this is having a bearing. What it says, the committee shall not consider any resolution plan received after the time. That means the time is fixed the committee is also has to function within those timelines and whatever the decision, whatever the bargaining, 
whatever the you know arguments with the resolution applicant are bringing them to discussion table uh, and building the competition between the resolution applicants everything everything has to be completed within that time when time is restricted can they go that much of you know the can they really leverage whatever they want to have as a realization out of the resolution plan to reduce their haircuts that is one parameter we have to think Regulation 36B6, it says, request for the resolution plans. The resolution professional may, with the approval of the committee, extend the timeline for submission of the resolution plan. But the Act says 180 plus 90 days. Suppose there is some kind of court cases and all, 330 days. Beyond that, is there any possibility? It is not possible. Now there is an obligation on the COC and RP to complete the process within the timelines prescribed under IBC. Had there been more time available, COC could have tried for more realization. Yes, there is very much it, it, the possibility is there. The opportunity can be explored. If at all time is there, they may try with you know other mechanisms wherein they can try to realize more for themselves. Now, in the case law, what happened is this corporate debtor is Meghalaya Infratech Limited. And why it under dated 28 August 2019, the application filed by Allahabad Bank under Section 7 of the IBC for initiation of CIRP. So Allahabad Bank is the applicant and he they filed under Section 7 for initiation of the CIRP against Meghalaya Infratech Limited. And this was allowed. The RP invited expression of interest from the prospective resolution applicants. Yes, once it is allowed, the process will start and at that process, there is a stage where this expression of interest will come into the picture. So again, is the expression of interest issued by the resolution uh, professional to uh, for the resolution applicants, four EYS have come. From who all it has come? One is PPIPL, that is one company, along with others they have bid, and one Nagati along there, that is what the case we are uh, uh, discussing now. And then the third one is Abhishek Agarwal. And then fourth person is Ashish Jaisarya and others. There are the, these are the four expressions of interest. Now, all the resolution applicants were invited to submit their respective resolution plans by 24th January 2020. So that is the deadline given by the resolution professional saying that your resolution plan should come by 24th Jan 2020. The fifth meeting of COC was held on 11th February 2020. So 24th January, that, that is the deadline for submission. And then the COC has to decide that COC meeting date is 11th February 2020. The minutes of the said meeting would reveal that the RP informed the COC that there were numerous anomalies and deficiencies observed in the resolution plan of the PPIPL. So the PPIPL, one of the resolution applicants, the, they have also submitted the resolution plan, but in that resolution plan, there are so many mistakes or there are so many anomalies and uh, violations uh, to the provisions of the IPC. Then the same was intimated to the resolution applicant and requested to submit the same duly rectified by 1st February 2020. So the RBI has brought to the notice of the COC saying that since there are so many anomalies, we have requested these people to submit uh, the, after the uh, taking all the rectifications by 1st February 2020. However, PPIPL has failed to do so within that stipulated time. Now we are on the 11th February. So the, though PPIPL was first called upon by the COC to enhance the bid amount, it had specifically rejected the same. So uh, what happens generally in COC, we call all the resolution applicants and we try to bargain with them for enhancing the bid amount. The same opportunity was given to the PPIPL also, even though they have not rectified the same and submitted the rectified uh, resolution plan. So if you insisted on uh, disclosing the basis of score in the proceedings of the fifth meeting of the COC dated 11th February 2020, though Nagati Alang that had enhanced his bid from 63 crores to 64 crores, the representative of PPIPL subsequently came and requested for adjourning the meeting for a few days. So in this scenario, what happened? PPIPL has not rectified their resolution plan and they have not enhanced their bid amount. But the second person, that is Nagatya Lan, uh, he enhanced his bid amount from 63 crore to 64 crores. Then what option will be available with the COC? 
The said request was specifically rejected by the COC by informing the representative of PPIPL that it had to adhere to the IBC timelines and would have to conclude the matter by next day. So that is what uh, this uh, PPIL representative was arguing with the COC saying that you have to complete everything within the timelines and you give me the opportunity for the next day. Even on the next day, that is 12th February, when the adjourned proceedings of the COC were held, the respondent number one, that is PPIPL, had sent an email stating that the directors of its company will not be available for the said meeting and requested for deferring the meeting by a day or two. First of all, he only insisted that one more day has to be given, PPIPL uh, resolution applicant. Then the COC has uh, adjourned its meeting and kind of, kind of, uh, conducted on 12th February 2020. And on that agenda meeting also, what this person said, on this day, the directors are not available, so you defer this meeting. So on the insistence of all the prospective resolution applicants present, the COC clarified that since the timeline was coming to an end, it had decided to exclude the prospective resolution applicants who were not present in the said meeting. So the person who is not present is PPIPL. So they have excluded that resolution applicant from the prospective resolution applicants list. So in the said meeting, Nagachalang is there, came to be declared as the highest bidder after he approved his bid in the open bidding held between him and Mr. Abhishek Agarwal. Then resolution plan bid amount is 64.304, uh, which hello. is higher than the... Yeah. Sir. Uh. Sir. Illa, I have free service sir. next month. Pudu Andi. Okay. Yeah. So resolution plan bid amount is to be 64.30 crore, which is higher than the liquidation value. Liquidation value is 61.62 crore. So the financial creditors have a haircut of 51.44%. Now let us just discuss how the haircut scenario has to be understood in this scenario. Suppose this PPIPL person, uh, the resolution applicant was given time. Maybe there can be a chance that he may come up with a resolution plan amount beyond this 64.30, what this Nagatya Lang there has offered to the COC. There is a possibility. But since the timeline is not available and they have come to an end, they have to finish this process within the prescribed timelines as per IBC provisions. Now, there is no opportunity for this uh, COC to have a discussion or bargaining with the PPIPL and get an enhanced amount as a resolution plan amount from them. <laughs> so then uh, this uh, person has gone for uh, appeal. So what NCLAT has observed is, NCLAT opined that the appellants informed the company of creditors through resolution personnel about its intention to file a revised resolution plan, that is second resolution plan. Yeah, NCLAT is observing these points. Whether the appellant, that is the PPIPL, has given an opportunity or not to submit the revised resolution plan, yes, it was given, which actually came to be filed on 14 February 2020. So we deem it appropriate to dwell on the issue whether it, in exceptional circumstances, the timelines prescribed under IBC code can be relaxed. Now the first meeting is on 11th February. The agent meeting is on 12th February. The revised resolution plan by PPIPL was submitted on 14th February 2020, hardly within two days. But those two days are not falling within the timelines prescribed under IBC. So can that kind of relaxation be given? So that is what the question to be observed by NCLAT. To allow a prospective resolution applicant to submit a second or revised resolution plan, more so when it nearly involves a small period like one or two days, as in the instant case. So that is what NCLAT has discussed, but Supreme Court said that it could thus be seen that the RP as well as the COC had acted in a totally transparent manner. Is there any you know, uh, things hid from this uh, appellant? No, it is not like that. Everyone acted very transparent, well, both the RP and the COC. An equal opportunity was accorded to all the prospective resolution applicants. Yes, that uh, formality was also done. The equal opportunity was given to all the prospective resolution applicants. However, the result respondent number one, PPIPL, without improving his bid amount, went on insisting for more time, which request was specifically rejected by the COC. So this continuous demanding for more time, more time cannot be accepted. 
The COC was facing the timeline, which was to end by 24th February 2020, before which it had to finalize its decision. So the decision of the COC not to grant any further time for submission of its revised bid cannot be said to be falling in the category of the term material irregularity. So that's where the Supreme Court said that it is not a material irregularity. Everyone followed in a very transparent manner. So nothing can be done to that particular resolution of it. That is what the Supreme Court decided in this case. So it is a trite law that the commercial wisdom of the COC has been given paramount status without any judicial intervention. For ensuring co uh, completion of the processes within the timelines prescribed by the IDC, it has been consistently held that it is not open to the adjudicating authority, that is the NCLT, or the appellate authority, that is NCLAT, to take into consideration any other factor other than the one specified under Section 32 or Section 613 of the IBC. Therefore, the appeal was passed by the Supreme Court. This is what happened if, uh, in this particular case. And we have to understand the haircut scenario, resolution in a time-bound manner. Because it is in time-bound manner, we are not in a position to give or uh, we are not going to get an opportunity to bargain with the resolution applicants. So what are the important points? One of the main objective is completion of the resolution process in a time-bound manner. And sometimes this will not give sufficient time space to negotiate more with the resolution applicant and decision to be taken to the best resolution plan, which is available within the timeline boundaries. So whatever being available within those available plans itself, we have to decide. So the next point, the next parameter is commercial wisdom of COC. Anything uh, participants wants to discuss on uh, time-bound manner? Otherwise, I will go for the commercial wisdom of COC. Sir, uh, the time is still uh, is an issue with the NCLTs and CLATs actually. You know, it is prolonging. Is it, is it the reality? Sir, when time is coming into the picture, it is absolutely binding on all the stakeholders except court, sir. Except NCLT and NCLT. Yeah, that's a very sad fact. True. And given the situation, we don't have anything or any say in that matter. Government is if not listening have... to even filling up the posts. Is it so? <laughs> sir, sir, this is a public forum and we should not discuss those things. <laughs> Please, I agree, sir. I agree. It's just my way of opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please understand that you know our hands are tied and our lips are closed. <laughs> yeah. Shall I proceed with the commercial wisdom parameter while understanding haircut? Okay. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. So this is in uh, Som Distilleries Private Limited versus Pratibha Kandelwal RP for Mount Shivalik uh, Industries Limited, and this was decided by NCLAT New Delhi. What the provision says when we are talking about commercial wisdom, section 30, subsection 4 says, the committee of the creditors may approve a resolution plan by a vote of not less than 66% of the voting share of the financial creditors. Yes, if at all any plan has to be approved, the percentage of the voting should be at least 66%. After considering its feasibility and viability only, they will consider uh, the committee of creditors. So the uh, important sentence is after considering its feasibility and viability. So who will consider this feasibility and viability? It is the COC members. So that is why we say that is the commercial uh, wisdom of the committee of creditors. So the manner of distribution proposed, which may take into account the order of priority among the creditors as laid down in subsection 1 of section 53, including the priority and value of security interest of a secured creditor and such other requirements as may be specified by the board. So after considering all these parameters, the COC will decide whether to approve this resolution plan or not. If at all they want to approve, at least 66% of voting should be there. 39.3 says regulation, the committee shall evaluate the resolution plans received under subregulation 2 as per evaluation matrix. Yes, we all know that evaluation matrix will be defined and uh, COC will fix one evaluation matrix. We, within those parameters, they have to evaluate the uh, resolution plans received by them. And then records its deliberations on the feasibility and viability of each resolution plan and vote on all such resolution plans simultaneously. 
So again, the deliberations also has to be recorded based on the feasibility and viability of each resolution plan. And they have to, to definitely vote for all the resolution plans, uh, whether, whether they are approving it or not, that can be decided. Now the parameters of commercial wisdom of COC. The composition of total claims by the financial creditors includes not only the principal and interest, but other penalties and charges being levied to the extent possible to increase the total amount of claim. In the initial discussion, one of the participants uh, has mentioned this particular point. The penalties, charges, and all these things are all, you know, getting added up to the actual principal and interest. Yes, to a certain extent, because agreements and all are there, they are as per those agreements only they are charging. We can take it on a positive side. But still on the other side, you know, the penalties and charges, already this company is in a stress mode. And then levying this much will automatically enhance further stress on the company. So in the commercial wisdom of COC, are they going to take a call saying that these penalties and charges, okay, let us... Uh, uh, direct this from our actual claim. Let us see what is the actual principal and interest. That is one parameter COC will obviously consider while deciding a resolution plan, whether to approve it or not. Whether that portion being covered, the principal and interest at least is covered or not. That parameter, all financial creditors will invariably uh, see while approving the resolution plan. The, and another parameters. The potential upside for creditors through equity holding post resolution. If you see the resolution plan per se, whatever the amount being offered in the resolution plan, we should not see only the amount, what only the cash portion. Sometimes the kind portion is also will be there in resolution plans. That kind portion is sometimes you know the uh, resolution plans uh, applicant will come saying that I will give you this much of equity after the post resolution. To the creditors. That implies the creditors are becoming the owners as a shareholders in the corporate debtor for the post resolution. Automatically, when this these big people are becoming the shareholders, nothing but like owners, then when the company is doing good, automatically they are they will be in a position to recover what they have lent to the company because the equity will not be against cash. They need not pump in cash again. The resolution applicant is offering the equity or in some cases, uh, uh, preference shares in some cases, even debt securities also, they will be offered. The resolution applicants will be offering to the creditors. So all these things are an added advantage. When we are seeing hair cut, the cash portion plus this also should be added so that the hair, hair cut portion percentage will be reduced. If you see on standalone basis of cash, hair cut percentage will be very high. Not only that, potential realization through reversal of avoidance transactions. Yes, if some avoidance transactions are there in the company, suppose after making an application by the resolution professional with the adjudicating authority for reversal of those transactions, uh, then whatever the amount are re getting realized, that again will go to the benefit of the creditors only. So haircut, if you see, if you totally remove this, haircut will be high. If you include this, then haircut percentage will be less. So while deciding to approve the resolution plan, this commercial wisdom will come into the picture because these people will have all this information available, readily available with them. The potential recovery from guarantors in a parallel proceeding. Once this proceeding is going against the CD, there is every chance and every possibility or right for the financial creditors to go against the personal guarantors or corporate guarantors as a parallel proceeding, they can definitely do that. So any amount getting realized from those guarantors, that is also adding value to their uh, claim amount. So the haircut will be reduced. And uh, one more important, uh, that is the last sentence, where one of our, the participants has already discussed this. Greater economic activity generated by resolution of the stress in the CD and the multiplier effect it has on the stakeholders and on the wider economy. Whatever that 2.59 uh, lakh crore rupees realized now, that again will be put into the industrial economy and that uh, economic activities will be taken care of by the other companies. So we are enhancing 
the potential of you know making profits are realizing their uh, amounts through this activity is also taken care of so these many parameters we should see and consider it as a commercial wisdom because the financial creditors will think not only just what is coming to me or is a plain vanilla plain vanilla is nothing but what has been offered as a care cash portion in the resolution plan no it is not like that you will be having so many you know add ons with that plain vanilla so all those things are this potential upside for the creditor through equity uh, participation or any uh, debt instruments also or realization through a re uh, reversal of these avoidance transactions or recovery from the guarantors and then whatever is been realized putting again into the industry putting again into the economic uh, uh, economy building activity and realizing and getting those profits so all these things will fall under the parameters of the commercial wisdom of coc now let us see what has happened in that particular uh, case law so here the corporate debtor is mount shivalik industries two appeals have been filed by the same appellant challenging different orders passed by the adjudicating authority there are two appeals filed by that particular appellant and uh, against two different orders one is that 910 of 2021 that appeal number in this what is the uh, issue the appellant's resolution plan was rejected by the coc the said decision was challenged by the appellant before the adjudicating authority the rejection of the resolution plan was challenged that is one appeal and there is an another appeal that is 909 of 2021 that is also filed by the same applicant questioning the order dated 13 2021 passed by the adjudicating authority approving the resolution plan submitted by kulls distilleries private limited that is a successful resolution applicant so what happened in this mount shivali case this appellant also has filed one uh, uh, submitted one resolution plan along with him this kulls distilleries private limited there is another resolution applicant he also submitted a resolution plan but coc has approved this resolution plan submitted by kulls distilleries rejected the applicant resolution plan filed by this applicant so again as rejection he filed one appeal again as approval of the successful resolution applicant's uh, resolution plan that also he has filed an appeal appellant challenged the order questioning the coc's resolution uh, being h1 his resolution plan has been rejected illegally so what is the contention why my resolution plan is been rejected though i am the h1 the highest bidder among all the resolution applicants but still coc has rejected my plan but coc has approved another resolution plan which is lesser than uh, the bid amount was lesser than what been offered by me that by the applicant that is the contention so messrs mahalakshmi traders who is one of the members of the coc holding a voting share of 22.4% colluded with the successful resolution applicant so this is what the content he is building his case saying that 22.4% voting share held by one of one coc member that is mahalakshmi traders this person colluded with the successful resolution applicant and that's why the entire coc rejected my plan but approved the kulls distilleries so due to which the appellant's resolution plan got rejected and resolution plan of kulls distilleries private limited that is the successful resolution applicant was approved so observation made by the adjudicating authority so here what hcld has observed even after deducting 22.4% voting share of mahalakshmi traders the resolution plan of the appellant could have been rejected by 77.76% see now in coc 22.4% is held by mahalakshmi then rest of the other coc members they are holding 77.76% if at all plan has to be approved only 66% is enough but the other coc members is are having 77.76% if at all this person is colluded what happened with the other coc members they would have approved or they would have rejected with this uh, 77.76% that is what the observation made by the adjudicating authority so mere fact that appellant was declared h1 earlier does not give any indefeasible right to the applicant just merely you know he being the h1 it cannot give any right saying that you know because why this will not give a right though it is h1 because our ibc mechanism is not a recovery mechanism we are not trying to recover the debts we are trying to see how the cd can be again bought into the 
uh, healthy condition how we can put into put it into uh, going concern mode how the economy can be enhanced all these are activities we are considering under idc it is not just plain simplicity of recovering power money if that is the scenario then h1 would have been approved other than h2 so coc is the best jet to watch commercial interest and addition of the coc which was taken with 100% vote is not to be interfered by in a, uh, by in exercise of judicial so once coc has done it has done its act what is that it has approved that culls distillery's resolution plan and that too it approved with 100% voting shares once coc has approved with 100% then where is the question for the judiciary to come and review it because this commercial wisdom is totally given for the coc and it is not vested with the an adjudicating authority so commercial wisdom of financial traders in rejection of a resolution plan is not challengeable so the first appeal is with uh, quashed so here while deciding this appeal nclat has they uh, you know depended on one uh, this case law the case shashidhar versus iob so with regard to commercial wisdom of the financial return the honorable supreme court laid down that there is an intrinsic assumption that financial traders are fully informed about the viability of the corporate debtor and feasibility of the proposed resolution plan yes in the provision itself we have understood the feasibility and viability has to be discussed and also to be recorded by the uh, coc minutes so the viability of the corporate debtor with this particular resolution plan it has to be decided by the coc and the feasibility of whether this resolution plan submitted can it be implemented or not is it really feasible or not has to be decided by the coc once these two parameters are taken care of by the coc it is the total commercial wisdom of the financial creditor and no one else have any kind of intervention so upon receipt of a rejected resolution plan the adjudicating authority is not expected to do anything more but is obligated to initiate liquidation process under section 33 subsection 1 so in that case it said once the plan is rejected automatically the uh, liquidation process will get initiated so it has to be uh, start uh, obligated on obligation on the coc the legislature has not endowed the adjudicating authority that is nclt with the jurisdiction or authority to analyze or evaluate the commercial decision of the coc this was all discussed in k shashidhar case so the same stance was applied by the nclat for this case also so much less to inquire into the justness of the rejection of the resolution plan by the dissenting financial traders so both the appeals were dismissed by the nclat so this is what happened in this particular case so what are the important points com uh, coming to the commercial wisdom of coc haircut decision is more relevant in comparison to the assets available but not with the claims submitted by the creditors so here the decision what the coc is taking is what assets are available when compared to the claims submitted by the creditors it is not that you know since you have given higher huge claim your claim has to be uh, satisfied it is not like that so what are the assets available that what is the value available of those assets based on that the coc will take a call that is part forming part of the commercial wisdom and what market offers as a value in relation to what a company brings on the table not what it owes to the creditors so what is been brought on the table that is what assets we are showcasing uh, to the resolution applicant uh, to purchase or to acquire that is making a more relevance and importance rather than what is been owed to the creditors so maximization of the value of the assets of the company is related to existing assets not of assets which were existed earlier so the assets which were existed earlier when they have given the out, the, the loan facility that is totally relevant because that asset is not there because of various reasons it has eroded now we cannot harp on those same situation now what is there available in my hand that asset how much i can maximize its value that is my my main parameter so at the same time the resolution applicants are asserting the assets at unfair valuation which is paving way to the erosion of the value of the cd in terms of time and preservation of the assets so at the same time what is rs resolution applicants are also ascertaining the assets sometimes unfair valuation has been provided by the resolution applicants if at all the resolution applicant is coming up with unfair valuation and they are totally reducing the value of the assets 
then as a COC, you have commercial wisdom saying that your resolution plan is not viable and it is not feasible. We are not going with your resolution plan and we can reject and saying that you reject that plan and go for liquidation because asset is available with you. You can definitely at any point of time, you can liquidate that asset and realize the amount and get it distributed. If RAs are uh, putting very less value to the uh, assets of the company. Yeah. Uh, anything we need to discuss on commercial wisdom of COC before me going with the third parameter that is balance in the interests of all stakeholders. Please feel free to ask me any questions. We can discuss. Shall I proceed with balancing the interests of all stakeholders? Yeah. So this can be understood by uh, discussing this particular case law that is uh, uh, Pratap Technocrats Private Limited and others versus Monitoring Committee of Reliance Infratel Limited and another. And this is again decided by the Supreme Court. So what is the provision when we are talking about balancing the interest of stakeholders? The provision is section 30, subsection 2, clause B says, it provides for the payment of debts of operational creditors in such manner as may be specified by the board, which shall not be less than. When we are making the payments, uh, the debts of the operational creditors has to be dealt in the following manner. What is that manner? It shall not be less than. The amount to be paid to such creditors in the event of a liquidation of the corporate debtor under Section 53. Suppose the corporate debtor is going for liquidation, let us assume. So in that event of liquidation, what is that amount which we are ought to be paying, paying to these creditors? That amount or the amount that would have been paid to such creditors if the amount to be distributed under the resolution plan had been distributed in accordance with the order of priority under 53. So if it is in a resolution plan, certain amount is being allocated. If that amount has to be distributed as per 53.1, whatever that amount is coming to be paid to that particular creditor. So these two amounts we will be comparing. Whichever is higher, we have to pay. So for removal of doubts, it is hereby clarified that a distribution in accordance with the provision of this clause shall be fair and equitable to such creditors. So uh, uh, the explanation is also provided. It says distribution, yes, it has to be done, but the distribution should be in accordance with the provisions of this clause shall be fair and equitable to such creditors. Uh, that such creditors will uh, fall a very important uh, point here when deciding this. So the corporate debtor is Reliance Infratel Limited in this particular case. The resolution plan was submitted by Reliance Digital Platform and Project Services Limited. CD is Reliance Infratel, RIL, and resolution plan is given and submitted by Reliance Digital Platform and Project Services Limited. And it was declared as a successful resolution applicant on the 19th meeting of the COC held on 2nd March 2020. So this person was declared as a uh, successful resolution applicant in 19th meeting. The resolution plan was approved with 100% voting share of the COC. Yes. The plan, there is uh, not even a single uh, financial creditor has voted against this. So enter 100% voted in favor by, while approving the resolution plan submitted by this Reliance Digital. So an application was submitted under Section 36 of the IPC by the RP seeking the approval of the resolution plan by the NCLT. So once the approval was received from the COC, obviously the resolution professional has to submit an application with the IPC. That is what this, uh, this case also the RP did. The NCLT by its order dated 33-12-2020 approved the resolution plan and the appellants challenged the decision of the NCLT approving the resolution plan in appeal before the end plan. Adjudicating authority also has approved the resolution plan and passed an order on 3-12-2020. Again, it's that order the appellants have gone for an appeal to with end plan. Now let us see what is being offered. Since we are discussing the parameter of balancing of interest of all stakeholders, how the distribution is done in this particular case, we will see. CRP cost, yes, it has to be paid in full and the priority will be there. That is why the percentage of recovery mentioned as 100%. No one can go less than this. 
because uh, it is the mandatory thing, 100% is given here. For workmen or employees, what is the amount admitted? It is 1, lakh, uh, 1 crore 81 lakhs odd. The entire amount processed under the plan is 1.81 crores. So 100% is being offered to workmen and employees in the resolution plan. Related parties. There are, are potential related parties. It is 269.94 crores the claims they have submitted. But under the plan, because they may be related parties, they allocated nil. So it is zero percentage. Then statutory creditors are there. So statutory, that is government dues and all, 31.32 crores. So again, is that 4.04 crores was allocated to the statutory dues. That is coming around 12.91 percentage. The other category that is operational creditors, that is other than related parties and statutory creditors. So uh, related parties, it is totally made zero. So that's why other than related parties and other than the statutory creditors, who are all the operational creditors, for them it is 129.28 crores is the amount admitted. And for them, 25.36 crores is offered under the resolution plan, which is coming to 19.62 percentage. Then other creditors are there, 904 uh, uh, crores. And again, is that 43 lakhs is being offered. It is mentioned as 100%. Don't worry why it is being mentioned as 100%, I will tell you. In 904 crores, there are two uh, related parties are there. And for them also, uh, the uh, allocation is nil and they have waived off. So that amount is uh, removed. And the balance creditors, whatever that amount is there, it, that is exactly ma matching that 43.87. So it is 100%. Then comes the financial creditors. That is... 41,055 odd crores. Again, is that they have only offered 4,235.77 crores. That is nothing but 10.32% only. For financial letters, it is 10.32%. And operational letters, it is 19.62%. So here, the main uh, argument is going between these two set of creditors. 10.32 versus 19.62. Now, the operational creditors with verified or admitted claims of up to 1 crore rupees, it is 50% of the verified claims is being offered. And operational creditors with verified and admitted claims of more than 1 crore, it is the offered amount under resolution plan is 50% of the amount up to 1 crore and 10% of the amount over and above the 1 crore of the verified claims. That is how the resolution plan is uh, set up for operational creditors. Out of the total verified other creditors debt, claim of 904, this is what I'm telling you, uh, how it became 100%. Uh, this now out of 904 uh, uh, crores, which is belongs to its affiliates of the resolution applicant, that is RJIL and JDFPL. So since they are the affiliates of the resolution applicant, that's where he's not allocating anything to those uh, affiliates of the resolution applicants. And that's where the out of 904 crores, for only 48 lakhs for other creditors has to be given. So RJIL and JDFPL have agreed to weigh their rights towards the uh, any payments under this plan. So any payments due to RJIL and JDFPL shall stand expressly extinguished on the effective dates. So that entire amount was extinguished on the effective date. So payment of 100% amount to the remaining creditors in this category has been envisaged under the plan. Now, out of the total resolution amount, the resolution applicant will make payment to the financial editors only after. So, when the financial editors are getting this amount, after making the post payment of unpaid CRP costs, workmen and employees, and operational creditors. So, very fairly, that resolution applicant was uh, drafted. After me meeting the CRP costs, after me meeting the workmen and employee costs, and after me meeting the operational drop, creditors uh, amounts, then only I'm going to make the payments to the financial creditors. So the balance amount of the infused resolution plan of INR 3720 crores would be distributed between and among us the financial creditors on pro rata basis to their debt. So whatever the pro rata basis that a balance 3720 crores has been be distributed. So payment to financial creditors from the value realized from the preference shares in Reliance, Reliance Reality Limited is 800 crores. Now you, uh, you can ask me when there is an amount like 4,235 crores is being offered to financial creditors. 
So out of this 4,235, how this 3,720 crores only has been uh, distributed because there is one 800 crores in the form of preference shares in Real, uh, Reliance Reality Limited is there. So the CD has issued preference shares to one Reliance Reality RRL and that, uh, the, that amount is 800 crores. So how we are going to deal with these 800 crores that I will say. Reliance Bhutan Limited wholly owned subsidiary of the corporate director holds this preference shares in one of the other group companies of Reliance Communications Group, that is Reliance Reality Limited, which holds certain real estate assets. In the event, RRL is able to sell its real estate assets for an amount of 800 crores, that is against the preference shares, whatever the assets held by them, if they can sell those assets and realize that 800 crores, what are the taxes and transaction costs reduced? Then the value released from the preference shares held by RBL and RRL to be distributed to the approving financial creditors. So that is this 800 crores also added to the 3720 crores will be paid to the financial creditors if at all those real estate assets were sold against these private preference shares. In the event, the amount expected to be realized from the sale of those real estate assets is less than 800 crores, then the resolution applicant will purchase the real estate assets of RRL at 800 crores. So what this resolution applicant is saying, you sell those estates, if you realize those 800 crores, give it to the financial creditors. If you could not get, or if the realization is less than 800 crores, don't worry, I will purchase those real estate assets, I will give you the 800 crores, that 800 crores also, to be distributed to the approving financial creditors along with that 3,750 crores. That is what the what has been mentioned in the resolution plan. See the grounds of challenge. Now that there is a particular order, if a resolution plan was approved, no? so the again is that order. What are the grounds the appellant was making? The appellants were kept unaware of the CIRP. And no details were provided by the RP as regards to the disposal of the fund towards their claims. So first content is they are saying, we are not aware of the CIRP and no details were provided to us. And the claims of the applicants have not received a fair and equitable treatment. Once they come to know about the CIRP, what are the claims they uh, submitted to the resolution professional, if they have not received the fair and equitable treatment as how the claims of others have been treated. That is what another ground. The fair market value and the liquidation value of the corporate debtor has not been taken into account and an amount of these 800 crores being the value of certain preference shares did not form part of the corpus of the payments to the operational creditors. Since the resolution applicant is coming and saying that 3,720 crores will be paid to the financial creditors plus how I am going to deal with these 800 crores, now the operational creditors are saying that this 800 crores is not being informed to us and it is not made form part of the corpus to make the payment to the operational creditors also. That is another contention. Very important and crucial condition is this one. There were material irregularities in the accumulation and dispersal of the funds that constituted the corpus of the corporate data. So there, there are so much of material irregularities are there while dispersing the funds, etc. So this is that is another ground. The appellants were made to suffer a reduction of 90% of their total claims, while substantial claims of nearly rupees 120 crores have been rejected. When considering this uh, operational data as uh, claims, 90% of the claims were rejected. That is another contention of the operational claims. So while deciding this case, NCLAT has observed on the following parameters. The NCLAT rejected the appeal. Even the Supreme Court also it has uh, dismissed the appeal. On what basis they have rejected? No substance in the grievance that the operational data has been unfairly or inequitably treated in regard to the distribution of funds. First of the point, what they said is, there is no unfair treatment towards this operational data. Everything was done very fairly. As a matter of fact, operational creditors, that is, other than related parties and statutory creditors, were allocated 19.62% of the upfront payment of, uh, of 3,720 crores, while the financial creditors were paid only an amount of 10.32% of the upfront payment. As we have seen in the table, 10.32% was offered to the financial creditors and 19.62% is offered to the operational creditors. 
So where is the unfair treatment? In fact, operational directors have been given more percentage. So in dealing with the submission, that there was an absence of equitable treatment of the operational directors, the NCLAT held that equitable treatment can be claimed only by similarly situated creditors. So in the similarly situated creditors, that is within operational creditors, if there is any un unequitable treatment, that can be addressed. This creditor status, the creditor category itself is different. So here there is no question of, you know, discussing on the equitable treatment. That is what the NCLAT and Supreme Court are saying. So operational creditors stand on a different footing as compared to financial creditors. They are entitled to receive payments not less than liquidation value, which does not apply to financial creditors. So while we were discussing the provision, the payment should not be less than the liquidation value. Those two parameters we have discussed. You know? So that kind of situation is not there with the financial creditors. So fair and equitable treatment, in other words, is what is fair and equitable between the operational creditors as a class and not between different classes of creditors. That is what being observed. So in different classes, there is no question of discussing on equitable treatment. Equitable treatment always will be on same kind of category of the creditors that is within the operational creditors only in this given case. Yeah. Any doubts on this or any discussion points? So that I will go with the another parameter. No, can you just, uh, Madhav, uh, go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. See, uh, this uh, argument that in the OCs, there's a specific provision. They will yeah. not receive payment less than the liquidation value available to them. Yes. Now, though the, this wording is not there in respect of financial creditors, but in practice, when you say that uh, as per the, they're entitled to what they're entitled to the under that uh, section 53, order of priority, then they also yes. actually have a claim on the liquidation value. Yes, they do have. But sir, sometimes, you know, if liquidation value, if it is very less, uh, then the financial creditors may get much lesser than uh, uh, what the operation creditors may get as a liquidation value in proportion to their claims. There is a possibility. Sir, among the, among the operational creditors, the worst affected were the employees of the CD. Am I right? Yes, sir. But sometimes, you know, in this particular case, if you have seen, employees and workmen have got 100%, sir. That happens very rarely, sir. Very rarely, yes. I do agree. Very rarely it happens. But this is the classic case where employees and workmen got really 100% of their total claims. And admission also 100%. That is not the scene with the uh, operational creditors and financial creditors. If you see the table, you know, uh, yeah. See, workmen and employees, 1.81 crores and 1.81 crores is totally, you know, the amount proposed. Great, great. That's great. Shall we go with the withdrawal? I think it is the break time. No? It is 3.30. Generally, break uh, will be given by, I think, 15 minutes. Anjali, are you there? Shall we take, sir, some 10 minutes to 15 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes we can have. Yeah, 10 minutes we can have. Yeah. Then we will discuss this.
Shall we proceed, sir? Yes, sir, we can proceed. Yeah, okay. thank you. So the next point is, uh, the next another parameter is withdrawal under section 12A. So how withdrawal under section 12A is making an impact on haircut, how haircut should be understood with this particular of uh, transaction, with this particular transaction, let us see. So this is uh, mainly dealt under uh, Vallal RCK versus Mr. Siva Industries and Holdings Limited and Abhijit Gurta Kutta RP. And it is decided by, again, Supreme Court. Yeah. So what, what provision says 12A? Section 12A is the adjudicating authority may allow the withdrawal of application admitted under Section 7 or Section 9 or Section 10 or an application made by the applicant with the approval of 90% voting share of the committee of creditors in such manner as may be specified. Suppose any withdrawal has to be made for, uh, for the uh, against the CIRP, that can be done by way of filing an application with the adjudicating authority after receiving 90% of the voting share from COC. But there is one regulation 30A also. 30A1 says an application on a withdrawal under Section 12A may be made to adjudicating authority. If at all, if it is before constitution of the committee, the, by the applicant through the interim resolution professional. If it is after the constitution of the committee, by the applicant through the interim resolution professional or the resolution professional as the case may be. Provided where the application is made under clause B, that is after constitution of committee and after issue of expression of interest under regulation 36A, the applicant shall state the reasons justifying withdrawal after issue of such invitation. Why the applicant has to specify the reasons uh, for justification of withdrawal, because after expression of interest is filed, there can be chance that resolution applicants may express their interest. So a contract is getting seized between the uh, resolution applicant and the corporate debtor through COC. So in that scenario, if at all the invitation for expression of interest is given, they have to specify the reasons clearly. Now, we will see the facts for this particular case. Corporate debtor is Siva Industries and Holdings Limited, that is the CD, and pursuant to public announcement, the claims received is 4,863.87 crores. So that much of claims have been received pursuant to the public announcement. So successful resolution of claim, that is Royal Partners Investment Fund Limited. Royal Partners Investment Fund is the successful resolution of claim in this scenario. And they have submitted the resolution plan, but the problem here is, the approval received is 60.90% only. But if at all any resolution plan has to be approved, how much is the percentage? It is 66%. But in the given case, it is only 60.90% was received as an approval for the resolution plan. Since the 66% threshold is not been met, the RP, the obvious, the only course of action available with RP is. He has to make an application with the adjudicating authority for seeking liquidation orders under 33 1B. So, accordingly, this RP has made an application with the adjudicating authority for liquidation. So, one shareholder of the CD has made an application under 65 proposing one time settlement offer. In the meantime, what happened? In this particular CD, there is one shareholder, and that shareholder has come up with a one time settlement offer. And, and, uh, and wanted to make an application under 60, subsection 5, for approval of this one time settlement offer. COC, what they did, they considered an agenda item of withdrawal consequent to submission of the settlement plan. Since the shareholder has come up with one time OTS settlement, now COC considered an agenda item of withdrawing the CRP process because settlement is been offered now. So withdrawal agenda item is passed only with 70.63 percentage. Here also the problem was there. Generally withdrawal petition as per the 12A, it should be 90% of the COC approval should be there. But here what happened, it is only 70.63% uh, uh, approval was received. Then in the meantime, one uh, beautiful thing happened. One of the financial letters, that is IARCL, has conveyed its interest to change their vote from rejection to approval. 
so since they have initially they placed a rejection so that's why the voting percentage against this ods is 70.63 only but these people decided to alter and they want to make it as an approval for the ods so with that approval change of iarcl what the percentage is is the army made an application to educating authority to give directions and accordingly got permission to conduct coc meeting again and in that meeting approval was accorded with 94.23 percentage so once iarcl has given the approval from 70.63 percentage it went up to 94.23 percentage where the threshold is 90% itself so it is way beyond than 90% then automatically the one time settlement uh, say uh, since they are getting one time settlement the withdrawal has got necessary approval from the coc but the situation is different the main petitioner in the original application is idpi and whose entered claim is 876.06 crore out of the total 4863.86 crores in this since the main petitioner is idpi in this coc they mentioned before educating other this with this ground since the liquidation value is only 229 crores approximately and prospective resolution applicant has submitted 245 crores against the 328 crores offered by promoter as settlement and this may be allowed so these people are since they are the applicants they made a petition saying that since the uh, amount offered by the promoter is way more than the liquidation value so please approve uh, your consent for the withdrawal application what is been filed before adjudicating authority now let us see what is the percent offered in settlement offer so financial central bank of india admitted amount is 402.95 crores and settlement amount is 45 crores lic it is 354.36 admitted amount 160 crores is offered to them sbi it is 280 crores offered under settlement is 25 crores union bank of india 64.17 crores admitted amount 30 crores is the settlement amount iarcl is 1147.69 crores and settlement amount is 15.55 crores now you can understand why iarcl has initially uh, mentioned as rejection because it is 1147 crores again is the hardly they are getting 15 crores only but why they have changed it to approval we don't know that can be the internal process of the uh, coc meetings and minutes and all so that is not known to us so idpi 876 crores is the admitted amount and settlement amount is 37 crores pnb it is 305 crores admitted amount and settlement amount is 4.14 crores bank of india it is 74 admitted and 1 crore is the settlement amount masdar energy limited uae that is 776 crores is the admitted amount 10.52 is the settlement amount offered now you can ask me one question why the settlement we are all thinking in the previous case itself you know the equal treatment should be there between the class if it is resolution plan yes all the financial creditors should have the similar percentage of uh, uh, distribution uh, this thing between secured financial creditors and our unsecured financial creditors as the category since this is a settlement offer there is no such restriction or parameter defined under ibc under settlement offer it is like you know i am offering this much are you okay with it or not if they are okay it is you can you can kindly go ahead there is nothing like uh, disputing between them since they are agreeing for the settlement offer a different different types of uh, settlement amounts can be offered under the settlement ods scheme now state bank of india who is the one who is one of the financial leaders who has voted against the settlement proposal and they uh, sbi has voted against since uh, the voting percentage is only 94.83 the remaining person is held by sbi the state bank of india has sought for a direction to declare that the mortgage rights of the applicant over the immovable property offered will not get diluted upon withdrawal so once this withdrawal has happened whatever the mortgage rights this bank is having they will not get diluted yes obviously once withdrawal is done the cd will become a normal company it is out of the ibc then what all the previous things are prevailing like uh, uh, these uh, charges uh, etc mortgage rights etc all those things will take the same uh, stand now 
So State Bank of India does not appear to have any objection for the withdrawal of the CRP, provided that the rights of this bank or the mortgage property should not get dilated. So only the point of contention for SBI is, if their mortgage rights are not getting diluted, they are okay with the settlement offer. Now in this, there's a uh, settlement offer application also, application for withdrawal also filed and a liquidation uh, this thing also filed before the adjudicating authority. So what NCLT as an adjudicating authority has decided is, they found that the settlement plan appears like a corporate restructuring plan and is not like a settlement simpliciter. So the adjudicating authority should be vigilant while considering settlement plan under section 12A. Since this is plan appearing to me like as a corporate restructuring plan, not like a simpliciter, simply a settlement scheme, so I should be vigilant while granting permission under section 12A. It should permit unprejudiced settlement plan for approval. So there should not be any prejudiced plan. It should be an unprejudiced settlement plan. Then only adjudicating authority can approve. That is what the observation made by NCLT. So applicant has prayed for liquidation of the CD in case of the failure of the, of the terms of the settlement proposal. So in the application, what this applicant has made, uh, if settlement proposal, whatever been offered and we are withdrawing, if that is failed, yeah, the failure of the terms of this settlement proposal, immediately you have to uh, uh, issue an order for the liquidation. Now, this particular sentence is very much important, very, very crucial also. Under withdrawal, if settlement is arrived and withdrawal application is made, once withdrawal application is approved, where from the applicability of the IBC provisions will come into the picture? IBC cannot be applied like approving resolution plan or approving an order for liquidation of the CD. Nothing will come into the picture. But the applicant has paid for liquidation of the CD in case of the failure of the terms of the settlement proposal. This is what the prayer mentioned uh, by the uh, applicant. Then adjudicating authority found that once petitioner has agreed for a withdrawal, there cannot be any strings attached. Yes. For me, what the NCLT has observed, it it looks like appears to be more relevant also uh, because this withdrawal petition, if you want to withdraw, you withdraw. That's it. You should not say that, oh, on this condition, I am going to withdraw. If this is not happening, I want this kind of relief. Those things will not be there. Once it is withdrawn, you are out of IBC. You are out of the NCLT, CRP process. That's it. So that is what uh, the NCLT has observed. Now, as the adjudicating authority also mentioned that section 7, 9, 10 applications are for insolvency resolution, but not for recovery of money. Why these petitions are made under be it 7, be it 9, or be it 10 application? Why we are making, we are trying to make a test the solvency of the CD. We are not trying to recover the money. But under withdrawal, if you see the intention of the withdrawal petition, what is it mainly? Since you have recovered your claim amount. Now you want to go out of the CRP process. That is the aspect of withdrawal uh, petition. That is the main substance for making a withdrawal petition. But these applications under 7, 9, 10 is for what? It is for testing the solvency. It is not for recovering the money. The motto is totally different. So COC should have voted for the settlement proposal only on receipt of money in entirety from the promoter of the CD. So Anklet also said that same thing. If settlement is made, okay, after a total receipt of your money, then you go for withdrawal because there is no purpose in uh, continuing the CRP. The application for withdrawal was dismissed. Even Anklet also dismissed the application for withdrawal. The application for liquidation was allowed because of the dismissal of section 12. Since withdrawal application was dismissed, now the leftover is the liquidation uh, procedure only. So the liquidation application was allowed by the adjudicating authority. MCAT also dismissed both the appeals and upheld the decision of NCIT Chennai. So this is what uh, has happened. Now, before we uh, understanding what Supreme Court said, let us see the important points under this withdrawal under Section 12A. Promoter, except for MSME, is not eligible under Section 29A. But a small detour by the promoter to avoid 29-year restriction is offering OTS. 
Now, leave under normal companies, apart from MSME, what is happening? The promoter cannot come and take over the company through IBC mechanism because that will become a backdoor entry. But as a loophole to 29A, is this 12A not functioning? Yes, 12A is functioning in an other way around. Again, you need not follow any 29A, you need not follow any of the provisions of IBC. Simply when the OTS has been offered, then you are out of the uh, CIRP process and you can do whatever you want to do with that company. So negotiation for OTS is happening at a huge haircut. When negotiation is happening for this OTS, a huge haircut is happening. Just now we have seen this. Uh, see, when you compare the settlement amounts offered by the uh, promoter against the admitted amounts of the claims of respective banks, there is no comparison at all. Sometimes, so even in few cases, it is more than 95%. That is how it is. Yeah. So even after the resolution plan is approved by the COC, this scenario is prevented. So after withdrawal, if approved settlement scheme could not be implemented, suppose let us hypothetically, let us assume the settlement scheme is offered and withdrawal is also done. And particular situation, the settlement scheme, whatever been offered, is not been implemented, or maybe the payments were not done. Then what is the recourse available to this uh, COC that uh, financial creditors? The opportunity to liquidate the CD is not available in the court. If once you are out of the CRP pursuant to withdrawal application, then there is nothing like you can not offer liquidation or you cannot offer anything. So this is diluting one of the most important objectives of the court that is time-bound resolution process. So the creditors are often seen voting for the withdrawal applications in the greed of upfront cash without considering the objective of the revival of the company. So these are the main important points. But uh, Supreme Court has gone in an altogether different uh, dimension in, in this case. If the COC arbitrarily rejects a just settlement and or a withdrawal claim, the learned NCLD and thereafter the learned NCLAT can always set aside such decision under the provisions of the IBC. So what Supreme Court is saying, if COC arbitrarily rejects a settlement and or a withdrawal claim, then the NCLD or NCLAT, whoever it may be, can take uh, and always set aside that particular decision. And the commercial wisdom of the COC has been given paramount status without any judicial intervention for ensuring completion of the stated processes within the uh, timelines prescribed by the IBC. So Supreme Court is saying that, that you should not interfere with the commercial wisdom of the COC. Since the COC decided to withdraw the petition, let them go and uh, go ahead and withdraw the petition. The provisions under Section 12 of the IBC have been made more stringent as compared to Section 30, Subsection 4 of the IBC. Whereas under Section 30, Subsection 4 of the IBC, the voting share of the COC for approving the resolution plan is 66%. 30, Subsection 4 is approval of resolution plan. There, the percentage of voting is 66%, but 28 is 90%. It implies that if 90% members are agreeing for that, it is for their own commercial wisdom. So when 90% and more of its creditors in their wisdom, after due deliberations, find that it will be in the interest of all the stakeholders to permit the settlement and withdraw the CIRP. In our view, the adjudicating authority or the appellate authority cannot sit in an appeal over the commercial wisdom of the CUC. This is what the Supreme Court has mentioned. So how many of you agree with this? I don't know. I have my own reasons, but this kind of in, uh, interpretation, though 90% is there, but the opportunity of liquidating the company or opportunity of resolving the CD under CRP mechanism is being lost. That is what I personally feel. It's only my personal the interference would be warranted only when the adjudicating authority or the appellate authority finds the decision of the COC to be wholly capricious, arbitrary, irrational, and inverse the provisions of the statute or the rules. So if these things are happened, if COC is arbitrarily behaving, arbitrarily or it is behaving very irrationally, then only you go and uh, decide and uh, interfere with the decision. Otherwise, there is no necessity of interfering with the commercial wisdom. 
in the present case the decision of the coc was taken after the members of the coc had due deliberation to consider the pros and cons of the settlement plan and took a decision exercising their commercial wisdom so once the scheme is offered they are also not uh, just like that they are approving they might have done or, or understood all the pros and cons they might have deliberated it thoroughly and then only they have approved the settlement plan so let us go ahead with that uh, settlement plan. The court held that we are therefore of the considered view that neither the learned NCLT nor the learned and flat were justified in not giving weightage to the commercial wisdom of the COC. These two authorities have not given weightage to the commercial wisdom, so that's why it is not uh, appropriate. The court has time and again emphasized the need for minimal judicial interference by the NCLAT and NCLD in the framework of IBC. So the appeals are allowed. So Supreme Court allowed the appeals, whereas NCLD and NCLAT has dismissed the appeals. Before me going ahead, any uh, observation or discussion you want to make on this particular case? Yeah. Let me proceed with another parameter that is avoidance transactions. In avoidance transactions, let us see and uh, let us understand. This particular very beautiful case, uh, this one, 63 Moves Technologies Limited versus the Administrator of the Divan Housing Finance Corporation Limited. And this was decided by NCLAT New Delhi. The IBC contains four types of transactions. What are these four types of avoidable transactions? Preferential, undervalued, fraudulent, and extortionate transactions. These are all PUFE transactions, we call them in general. So resolution professional or liquidator has to identify and file applications with NCLT for reversing those transactions. When the process under CIRP or the liquidation is going on, the corresponding resolution professional or the liquidator has to identify if at all any such kind of transactions are there. If such kind of transactions are